Pain, pain's a part of life. I think some people believe it's a test of your faith, but if you don't have a faith to believe in, it kind of makes you wonder why, why is there suffering in this world? It was a reason why he took him. Uh, maybe he needed some angels up there to protect, protect, to help him in the fight against the devil. A baby is a beautiful, wonderful thing. Why doesn't he want me to have this? Bad things are just the way that you see them. I think God's in everything we do. Why would anybody want to create people who do horrible things to each other? It doesn't make any sense. I don't think God's sitting there and saying these people are hurting and maybe I should help them. I suppose the answers will come. It's just I'm going through a journey right now that's painful. As you've already heard, we're really glad that you're here. If you're here as a guest or here, have been with us for a long time. We're in the third week of a series exploring God through by asking some big questions. Um, I wanted to say, by the way, on that note of Micah, Micah 6 8, that event that, that's coming up this coming Saturday is uh, you'll, you'll be blessed if you come. I hope you'll make plans to be there. You won't want to miss that. Michael Thompson, who is our guest musician, is actually here with his wife and family with us. Uh, I've, he's a tremendous uh, pianist, and you'll love his music. So. I hope you'll come, and, and we will do pray that all who do come, God opens our eyes to see people around us uh, differently in the needs and the way that we can make an impact. Uh, we're, we're tackling a tough subject this morning, um, in the words of uh, the great, probably the greatest cinematic masterpiece of the 20th century, The Princess Bride. You laugh, but this is a tremendous movie, and if you have not shown your kids this movie, you're, you're failing them as parents. <laughs> so, but uh, the man in black, who turns out to be Wesley says to Princess Buttercup when she says, you mock my pain. Some of you know this by heart. He says, life is pain, Highness. Anyone who says differently is selling something. All kidding aside, the movie makes a, a valid point. One of the things that, makes, that we share as human beings, regardless of your socioeconomic background, what country you grew up in, your nationality, your ethnicity, your gender, your race, um, how, how, what privileges you have had or have not had in life, one of the things that all human beings share is the experience of pain and suffering. Now, we don't all suffer the same way, but there's a 100% chance of suffering in your future. Good news, let us pray, right? It's like, it's just part of being alive. You live long enough and you're gonna experience emotional pain, relational pain, certainly physical pain. It comes for all of us. Those of us that are in the midst of it now, as Gretchen said, this is not a theoretical question. A philosophical question, it's a very personal question we're looking at how to survive. Those that are not in the middle of it right now, but you know people who are, or you look out at the world and you just, you can't help but ask big questions about why this happens. Where is God in the midst of it? So I, I don't want to speak at the philosophical or theological level in a way that would be cruel to those of you who are here who are in the middle of suffering. I saw people last hour who I know and love in our church family, and I know they're in the middle of it. We don't want to offer cold comfort. Nevertheless, the experience of pain inevitably leads us to ask big questions. We've already tackled, does life have a purpose, and is there a God? And now we come to, why would God, if he exists, allow pain and suffering? It's a little bit arrogant to think you're going to wrap that up in 30 minutes. That's not what we're trying to do. The whole series is trying to give the heart of the Christian worldview and how the Word of God, the Bible, addresses these kinds of questions to challenge us. And some of you, you've chosen to follow Jesus and you forget and you also have questions and this is to reaffirm your faith and realign you with who God is and what he says. I need that. Some of you are here and you're, you believe in God in a general way, but it's not personal for you. You haven't surrendered and you're still in process and we're praying this series draws you closer to that point of surrender. Others of you are here, and maybe you're here for the first time, or you really are a skeptic, and that's okay, because we all do have questions. The question we're dealing with is a tough one. It's, why does God allow pain and suffering? It's not actually a new question. Why does God allow pain and suffering? This is an ancient question. It goes back, well, one of the earliest statements of this question is by the Greek philosopher Epicurus in 300 BC, give or take. And he put it this way. If God is willing to prevent evil but not able, then he's not omnipotent. If he's able to prevent evil and suffering but not willing, then he is malevolent. It's not good. 
If he's both willing and able, then whence cometh suffering? Meaning, where, why does it exist if he's willing and able? If he's neither willing nor able, then we shouldn't call him God. You get his challenge to the existence of God? If God is all good and all powerful, and we know suffering exists, I don't have to convince you of that, hopefully, in the time it takes us to have an hour-long service together, maybe slightly longer, <laughs> More than five children will die by violent causes, domestic abuse and neglect worldwide. I could just spout statistics to you and we become numb to that. We know evil and suffering exists. If it does exist and God exists and he's all powerful and all good, how do you reconcile that? It feels like an impossible dilemma for the Christian view of God. I cannot believe in a God who the most common way to fill in the blank would take my baby, would allow genocide. I can't believe in that God. If the most common, when people were asked in our nation, Pew Research said, that if you could ask God one question, what would it be? It was this question. By far, the number one question. And those of us that have chosen to follow Jesus with our lives doesn't mean we don't have this question as well. Why does God allow pain and suffering? No, I've been studying about this and praying about this and thinking about it and reading and not just this week, but for a long time. And I, I'll tell you the answer right up front. I don't know. How's that for ready? You're dismissed. <laughs> I don't know. I don't ultimately know why your pain, my pain, and, the, and, and, and suffering exists in the world. I cannot give you a complete answer that will satisfy your every question. I don't think that one exists this side of eternity regardless of your worldview. I'm not saying that God's word doesn't have anything to say about that. We'll get to that in a minute. But what I'm saying is, this is a question for all of us. Christian, non-Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, everyone has to deal with this question of suffering. In fact, if you think about the world religions... They all have a place for suffering. If you're Hindu and the karmic religions are saying suffering is a result of past sin and immoral behavior, and you're working that off, you're paying for it in this life. The Buddhist religion says all of life is suffering, but you must reach enlightenment, which at that point you realize all of suffering is an illusion. If you're a Muslim, it's, it's inshallah, it's the will of Allah. You can't know, you just have to accept it. I would suggest that if you're a materialist atheist, if you, don't, if you believe when you die, you're worm food, there is no God, this physical universe is all that there is, this is an even bigger question for you. Because on what basis do you object to it? What do you get the idea that it's, it should be otherwise? We're here by accident. Natural selection, survival of the fittest is the law of the universe. Why should we object? The universe is not being cruel, it just is. The point I'm trying to make is that this is not just a Christian problem, it's a problem for all of us. It's a question for all of us. C.S. Lewis writes in his book, Mere Christianity, my argument against God when he was an atheist was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. But how would I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a, a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing it to when I called the world unjust and cruel? Suffering is a problem for all of us. About a year ago, I read a book by Luc Ferry. He's a French atheist existentialist philosopher. It might sound odd for a Baptist pastor to recommend a French atheist philosopher, but it's a fantastic book. It's called A Brief History of Thought, tracing out the development of philosophical thought in, Western, in the Western world. It's not boring, I guarantee you. It's really fascinating. And he writes this. Of all the cultures throughout human history, the one that gives its members the least adequate resources for dealing with, the suf with suffering and evil of life is our modern Western secular culture. Did you already say it? Of all the civilizations throughout human history, the one that does the worst job at preparing us to face the reality of suffering is our present Western secular culture. And we'll get into why that is. So let's ask the question, even though we can't give a perfect answer, what resources does God's word give us? What is the Christian view of this? How do we make any sense of it at all? I'm gonna to read to you from Romans chapter eight, a few selected passages. This is a remarkable chapter it would take us months of sermons to finish all of Romans 8, but 
it culminates here talking about future glory, and Paul says some very profound things. Paul writing to Christians living in Rome, and these are oppressed people. He writes this. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know to, what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And let's skip down now to, to um, verses 35 to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake, we're being killed all day long, we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life Neither angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's, it's a rich passage. And there's more, there's more than I, we have time to say about it. I want you to go back and think about the, the second word, the third word Paul says in English in the, in the Greek text. is the first word actually in Greek. For I consider. That word consider... It's an interesting word. It's the Greek word, logizomai. And it, it comes from the, the ancient world of accounting. It literally means to account properly for. To, to put in the right account, to credit to the right account. Paul is saying, I account for suffering now as not worth comparing to what's to come. And I think he's challenging us to ask the question, how do you account for suffering. Where do you put it? In what part of the ledger? And so, you know, one of the things that I notice in, in, our, in our contemporary culture is that for many people, we, we live in a civilization where suffering is not supposed to be. And so we don't want to think about it. In fact, I observe many of us, when pain comes into our lives, we want to distract ourselves from it. We want to do something to make it go away, go shop and have a, have a drink, go out, do something to not think about it. And I understand that. But there's a sense in which Paul is saying, I want you to think more about it. I want you to think more deeply and accurately. I want you to account for it properly so that you see it in its proper place. This passage gives us some critical resources for understanding suffering. First thing it says is there's a universal experience of suffering. Notice at the end when Paul says, for neither death nor life, right? Famine, da nakedness, danger, sword, these things will not separate us. Why does he list famine, danger, nakedness, persecution, sword, if they're not actually possible? The Christian view is not that we are immune to suffering. I think many of us that are believers, we think it like, about like this. Well, of course my life's not perfect, but now that I'm following God, he owes me something, so, uh, and I'm giving up my life for him, so you know, I, there are some things he won't let happen to me that's nowhere in the scripture. Job 5, verse 7, man is born for trouble as sparks fly upward. It just is. Jesus says, in this life, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. The universal experience of suffering, now there's different kinds of it. Some of it is easier to understand than others. There's the suffering that you cause. Terrible decisions, destructive behaviors, you bring it on yourself and those around you. I know about that, I'm guessing you do. There's the suffering that's caused by others. Their destructive decisions and narcissistic behavior or bad choices hurt you deeply. There's a suffering that just happens in the natural world, natural disasters, that's hard to, hard to stomach, but we could just say, well, the world is a dangerous place. 
But probably the suffering that's hardest for us to reconcile is what we might call the suffering of the innocent or the seemingly senseless suffering. My wife is a tutor for the Batavia School District. She tutors kids in, in their homes who can't be in school for various reasons. And one of the boys that she's tutoring is a 14-year-old boy with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. He just wants to be in school like other kids, you know. Most of you young kids, you want to be out of school. He's desperate to be in school. He goes to chemotherapy and she goes and tutors him for as long as he can handle it. He's wearing a mask and sometimes she is. Why? Parents who lose children, but that kind of suffering is hard to, to account for, to consider. Let's, let's look at the meaning of suffering. Even that phrase is, is challenging, but let's look at the, what the Bible says. There's some meaning in it. And I, according to the Christian worldview, there is no such thing, ultimately speaking, as meaningless suffering. It might feel like it, but there isn't ultimately any meaningless suffering. That is not to say all suffering is good or God's happy about it or that he causes it. No. But it's saying that he's bigger and he, it, there's something more happening than we see in, in experience. So I'll put it this way. You can't understand the Bible's teaching on suffering and pain unless you understand the Bible's teaching on a number of other things. And I'll, I'll, we'll do it this way. Eternity. Freedom. If you don't understand why there's an apple there, I'll explain that in a minute. What does the Bible have to say about freedom? Love. What, what is the biblical view of love? Uh, purpose. I mean, if there is no such thing as purposeless suffering, meaningless suffering, then what is God's purpose in it, even if he doesn't cause it? And I'll explain why there's a flame there. And then, oh, I left enough room. I'm glad about that. Um, justice. What does the Bible have to say about ultimate justice? Now, here's what I mean. The Bible offers a nuanced view. It's not just a, you know, a one-to-one um, equation where we suffer because of our sin and that's it. It's a nuanced view, and each of these things give us some resources, how they apply, what the Bible says about love and about freedom and about justice, about purpose and about eternity, help us understand suffering. You have to have all of them. And they're all really, in some ways, in Romans 8 and many other places, but that's where we are this morning. For example, let's take eternity for a minute. If you're a materialist atheist, you die, you're worm food, this universe is all that there is, then you think of your life as a line segment from birth to, you know, death. That's it. And it's, if you're fortunate, 80 to 90 years. And that's all you get. There's nothing else after that. It's over. That's it. But if that's how you see your life, then any suffering that happens in this window feels ultimate. There's no hope of redeeming it. There's no hope of it being made right someday. It's just, it it is. And so if this is all you get, you want to guard those years. And any pain that comes in feels like unjust and wrong. And we should do away with that. But what if your presupposition that this is your life is, is, is wrong? What if this is not your life, your life is not a line segment, but a ray, a ray that goes from your birth, however long, to your death, that's your life, but it doesn't stop there, it continues on into eternity, but it doesn't end. Now again, I'm not saying this explains away suffering, I'm saying if you see life different than this, like this. For I consider, logizomai, our present sufferings as not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed. If you could see your life as, 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 as this, then you're putting suffering in a different context, aren't you? Again, it's not a perfect answer, but it helps. It's a resource to help us see this is not the end. It feels like the end, but it's not the end. This changes how you think about it. Romans 8, 20, and 21 says that creation groans because it's been subjected to futility. What's that about? 
There's a lot of reference to groaning in this passage. Creation groans, we groan, the spirit groans, everybody's groaning. The word groans in Greek means like groaning, like, like someone dying on the battlefield. And, and it also can be used about childbirth. So some, it's groaning about what is to come, either death or birth. Pain about what's coming. What it's saying here is that when God created the world, this is Paul's way of referencing back to Genesis chapter one through three, that God created the world good without suffering or pain. Very good, he said, when he made human beings in his image and likeness to be in a loving relationship with him. We talked about that last week and the week before. But because of our sin, Genesis three, there's groaning. Subjected to futility or corruption, Paul says. And, but he made us in love to be in relationship with him. Yet, in order for us to be in love relationship with him, he has to give us a measure of moral responsibility we call freedom. I want my children to choose to love their mother and me and each other. More than that, I want them to love God. I cannot make them. I can't make them. The best I could do is put parameters by, by rewards and punishments to m modify their behavior, right? We do what we can to, to get them to behave right, but I can't change their heart. I don't have that power. I want them to freely choose to love God. I want them to see the love that God has for them and to surrender themselves to him. But that means they could choose otherwise. That means they might not. That's, listen to what N.T. Wright says about it in his book, Evil and Justice of God. The price of the possibility of love is freedom. And with freedom comes the possibility of pain, suffering, and evil. These, we would all agree that if, if a man <laughs> captures a woman and forces her to say that, he, that I love you to him, that's not love. That's a felony, right? You can't force that. You can woo, write poems, tell her how beautiful she is, but she must choose. And, and so God made us to be in relationship with him. But there's real accountability and moral responsibility. Listen to what Lewis writes about this in his book called The Problem of Pain, which is a great um, treatise on this very question. He says, we can perhaps conceive of a world in which God corrected the results of this abuse of free will by his creatures at every moment, so that a wooden beam becomes soft as grass when used as a weapon. And the air refuses to obey me if I attempt to set up in it sound waves that would carry lies or insults or profanity. But such a world would be one in which wrong actions were impossible, and therefore in which the freedom of the will would be void. Try to exclude the possibility of suffering which the order of nature and the existence of free wills involve, and you find that you've excluded life itself. Can you imagine that? If God, we, 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 I, I've said this, we want, God, why can't you stop that? Why couldn't you do something to prevent that? We have to think about what we're asking, really. Stop every evil act. Turn the bullets of a gun into marshmallows as they fly out. If I, someone's throwing a punch, turn their fist into jello. You're like, just do something to prevent it or stop it, right? Make it so it doesn't happen. Ultimately speaking, that would only work, not just if he prevented it once upon a time, but if every time God intervenes and stops and prevents. Now, sometimes he does. But if every time he did, there's no moral responsibility, there's no freedom, there's no real love. God created the world in love and created us to love him. First Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 7 brings us to this issue of purpose where Peter's writing to a church that's under extreme persecution, and he puts it this way. You'll see it here. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. So the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What is Paul saying, or Peter saying? He's saying, for a little while, you suffer trials, for I consider the present life is not worth comparing. And it's in this suffering and here, it's as if you're being refined and tested by fire. Now, that if, now I, I know if you're in the middle of it, you, everything in you wants to cry out, I don't want to be tested this way. This is unjust. 
And it doesn't mean God causes it. It means he can use it. It means he's greater than even the evil that we... If, if, I, if you have a bowl full of distilled pure water, no impurities, the purest water you can imagine, and you take a little eyedropper and put a drop of, of impurity in there, it's not visible, but you stir it up. Can you remove that drop? It's in there, right? Now think about every human who's ever lived, drop after drop after drop after drop after drop. That's polluted water. That's what we're living, swimming. We live in a broken, fallen world. But God is greater than that. Jesus says, take heart, I've overcome the world. I mean, I'm able to use even the worst things that happen. This is the message of the cross. The worst event in human history. God died. And we killed him. To do the most amazing thing that nobody saw coming. If you know the story of Joseph in the Old Testament, Genesis 50 is the culmination of the story. Maybe you come from a dysfunctional family. Maybe you've got some family pain in your past and some suffering that's been caused by just people inside the family behaving terribly. Maybe, I know some of you that's true about. You should read Genesis you know, 40 through 50. It'll make you feel better because that's a messed up family too. <laughs> Joseph's the youngest of 12 brothers and they don't like him because he's kind of a dad, not kind of, he's a total daddy's boy. Dad loves him the most, gives him a coat of many colors, which is like the symbol of his dad's favoritism, and his father should have known better. Jacob himself was, knew what that was like, but you know, the sins of the fathers repeat themselves on family. Some of you know that cycle of, of, of generational sin. Joseph is, uh, he's also not very aware, and so he says stupid things that inflame his brother's jealousy and rage, and they really hate him, and they plot to kill him. But Ephraim steps up and says, let's not, let's not kill him, that would displease God and our father. Instead, let's throw him in a pit. Let's beat him up and throw him in a pit. Like, okay, like God's okay with that. So they throw him in a pit, and they, they, um, they see a caravan coming by, and they have this brilliant idea. Let's get rid of him this way. We won't kill him, but we'll sell him as a slave to this caravan. And then we'll dip this stupid coat that our dad gave him in bl animal blood, and we'll tell our dad a lie that he was killed by wild animals. That's horrific. That is a horrific story of dysfunction. And if you're wondering, did God cause this? No, this is bad. You should not sell your brothers or sisters into slavery, in case you're wondering. That's bad. Don't do that. It's real evil causes real pain. And it goes from bad, from, from bad to worse for Joseph. He's, he ends up in prison and he's unjustly accused. But God is working behind the scenes in the midst of these terrible things that are unjust and cause great pain. And in Genesis 50, the end of the story, there's this verse 20. Joseph rises to power in Egypt, the, the most dominant empire in the world at the time, the number two man in the nation in the world. And that position is, God leverages that because there's a terrible famine that comes, the suffering of thousands, hundreds of thousands. And Joseph is able to save his family and the clan because of his role. And then daddy dies. Well, Jacob dies. And his brothers think he was only nice to us because dad was alive. Now we're going to get it. Now he's going to exact revenge. Because that's what you do eventually, right? You bide your time and then you get him. And they're cowering. And Joseph brings them in. And in verse 20, he says, you do not need to fear me. Because what you intended for evil, and it was evil, God intended for good. What a statement. Joseph has come to see that what you did, which was horrific and wrong and painful, God did something that none of us saw coming through it. That's the heart of the gospel. That's the heart of the Christian message. Now, don't misunderstand me. When you read Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good through those who love him and are called according to his purpose, some of you think, I hate that verse. Because this is not good, what happened to me. This is not good. This is not some cliche version of, oh, well, everything happens for a reason. That's not a good thing. By the way, that might be ultimately true, but never say that to somebody who's in great pain in the moment. God will bring them to that realization in his time, when they're ready to hear it. This is learning to trust the goodness and grace of God in the midst of pain. And in the fact that even human sin and suffering, he's greater than. I'm going to ask you a question. Can you think back on your life to something terrible that happened to you? Something painful you experienced? I look at some of your faces and I know what that thing is. Not all of you. But I'm guessing it's not hard, right? You could probably go there pretty quick. 
Now, even though we want to say God did not cause that, and it may not be resolved, you, it may still be acute, can you look back on that and see anything good that's happened in your life from it? Anything at all? Perhaps you're more empathetic to other sufferers. Maybe you've come to see the world differently because of what you experienced. Maybe you've been a source of comfort to somebody else who's in the pain that you were once in. I don't, whatever it is, any small measure of goodness. And I'm not saying it makes it okay. I'm not saying it balances it out. I'm saying, can you see that? I'm guessing some of you would say, I can't see anything yet. But most of you could probably say, yeah, I do. Then I'm going to ask you this question. If you can see some measure of good already in that terrible thing that happened in this little window, can you at least hold out the possibility that if this is true, that God might do something you don't yet see? That he might do something you don't yet even believe? You know, we use that, that, that it's called the dilemma, the trilemma for God. He's all powerful, all good, yet suffering exists. But you know what else he is? He's also eternal and all knowing. It changes the equation, doesn't it? If you bring in his, his eternal nature and you bring in his all knowledge, then it, it's, it changes the way we experience and understand. And you have to ask yourself the question, if you reject the existence of God on the basis of pain and suffering, does the fact that God does not exist in your mind help you and make it easier to face suffering and pain in your life? I'd say no. I'd rather go through it with him. doesn't make it, you don't get to have a life pain-free. Otherwise, what you're left with is just to say that because I cannot conceive of a reason or a purpose in this, there cannot be any. And think about that statement for a minute. I understand people who say, nothing good can come from this. But if you get back and have some perspective in your heart, what you're saying is, because I can't see it, I can't see any reason, there cannot be any reason. Is it possible that God sees what you don't see and he can do what you can't possibly conceive of? Alvin Plantinga, as a Christian philosopher, uses a thought experiment on this. He says, like, if, if he said to you, I want you to go into a puff tent and check and see if there's any St. Bernard's in there. <laughs> that's weird, but that's what he says. You wouldn't have to do but a glance, right? Nope, no St. Bernard's. You'd know immediately if there's St. Bernard's in there. Why? Because they're huge and they fill up the whole tent and hairy and slobbery. You wouldn't have to, like, look underneath things and check for them. You'd know immediately. But he says, if I said you go in that pup tent and check for any no Now, if you didn't grow up in the Midwest, you don't know what no are. They're definitely not in heaven. They're of the devil. They're little invisible gnats that get through the screen and bite you anyway, right? You couldn't, you, you couldn't just look real quick because you can't see them. That's why they call them no He says, many of us look at, at pain like this, like we're looking for a St. Bernard. Where's the reason? There can't be one. But maybe we don't see. Maybe it's there, but we do not yet see. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, right now in this life, right here, we, we see through a glass darkly. We look in a mirror that's smudged and, and cracked, and we don't see clearly. We see, but not clearly. A dim reflection. He says, then, meaning on the other side of eternity, we will see clearly. We will know fully, even as we are fully known right now. God fully knows you. Let's look at the redemption of suffering as we get ready to wrap this up. The redemption of suffering. Now, I realize that for some of you, this is kind of cold comfort. It might make intellectual sense to, at a certain point, but it doesn't help your heart. And again, something, suffering remains something of a mystery for all of us. Yet even our limited understanding, I think what the gospel of Jesus Christ offers us is so beautiful and so profound and so powerful, and you cannot get it anywhere else in the world. It's the most, I think, fully nuanced and powerful answer to the question we all face, what do you do with suffering? Uh, Timothy Keller wrote a book called Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering. I would recommend that book to you. It's a great blend of pastoral comfort and theological wisdom on this question. If you're a reader and, or you know somebody who's in the midst of it, that's a great resource. And in this book he says... The cross of Jesus Christ may not tell you precisely why you're facing your present pain, but it absolutely tells you what the reason is not. Now I want you to hear this. The cross of Jesus Christ tells us 
that even though you might know, not know yet right now exactly why you're experiencing suffering, it cannot be because God does not love you. It cannot be because God does not care. The cross tells you whatever the reason is, which I don't yet see, I know what it's not. It's not because God is distant and uncaring and disinterested. Why does that tell me that? Because he suffered. Because he suffered unjustly. He suffered horrifically, ultimately. The Christian God is not a God who wound up the universe, let it go, and now watches as we all muddle through in pain. It's a God who enters into our suffering. The message of the gospel is that God is not redeeming the world in spite of pain, but through it. He suffers with you. He suffered for you. It is through the suffering of God himself that the suffering of humanity is ultimately dealt with. This is what I mean by justice. There are no wrongs that will not ultimately be made right. That will not ultimately be set right on the cosmic scale. You know, at the end of the, of the Return of the King, Tolkien's great third part of the trilogy, if you just saw the movie, that's better than nothing, but read the book. Anyway, the, the, the movie changes it, but in the, in the movie, Pippin says to Gandalf, is everything sad now going to come untrue? What a great question. And the answer is yes. Ultimately, the Christian hope is that this is not the end, that Christ has paid for my sin and for yours, and he has achieved victory over the powers of sin and death and corruption and decay. And we don't yet fully see that in this little blip, but it's coming, for I Logitsomai, I consider that the sufferings of this present life, while horrific and painful at times, are not worth comparing. What does that tell you? As Corey Ten Boom, writing from a concentration camp, says, no matter how deep our darkness, he is deeper still. Speaking of Jesus. That the greatness of your pain tells you it's not worth comparing to what is to come. That the injustice done for you is going to be paid for. And that God is not immune to your pain. He is present with you in the midst of it. It's his purpose to defeat evil and suffering so completely on the cross that all of human sin and corruption and decay is swallowed up in his love and mercy and grace. I mean, there aren't words. I don't have them. Let me read to you something from somebody in our church family. Karen Harper wrote this on her Facebook page just a few days ago. Karen is the wife of John Harper, who was our facilities director for more than a decade, and we loved him and love him still. And if you want to read something that encourages you, read Karen Harper's Facebook page. And I asked her if I could share this. I mean, she posted on Facebook, but I asked her if I could share it, and she said she'd be honored. John died of a st massive stroke a little over six months ago. When, when, when we heard about it, it was, uh, he, they were up visiting her family in Minnesota. And um, she found John unresponsive on the floor. Took him to Mayo Clinic, and it was my, uh, that weekend I was not on to preach. It was my weekend off, and so it was just God's timing that I was the one that drove up. It would have been any of our pastors, but I drove up to be with the family, to be with Karen and her, their oldest son, Drew, and her family as they had to make a decision nobody wants to make. John's eyes are open, but he's not, there's nothing happening. He's being kept alive by the machines. Karen was weeping on his chest and hugging him and kissing him all over the face. And then she started laughing. And I was in the chair behind. I, and I was like, what? What is she laughing about? And she said, just occurred to me that the things John hated most were attention and public displays of affection. <laughs> and now he can't stop me, she said. But she had to make the, and they had to call their son, Marcus, who was in um, boot camp with the Navy Special Forces and, and, and get a conference call to tell him what had happened. Then they had to make the decision to take John off of life support and trust him into God's hands. That's what they did. And John went to be with Jesus. And Karen writes, wrote this. I couldn't read it last time, so I prepared myself. Six months ago today, with my head buried in his chest and my arms wrapped around him, I heard my husband's heart beat for the very last time. Over the previous 26 years of our marriage, I often rested my head on his chest as I like to hear 
our hearts beat simultaneously together. It was not only medically fascinating to me, but musically as well. It was as if our hearts were pounding out a melody together and always in sync with the creator of the music. Though John's heartbeat ended, mine continues to carry the melody that stopped with him as he took his last breath. John's heart beat with a passion for his God, his creator. It beat with care and compassion towards others. His heart beat with the goal of finding good in everyone, even when others didn't see it. And if you knew John, that's so true. I miss my partner, she writes. I miss the best half of my duet. But although my heart beats as a solo now, it still beats the same melody, to the same passion for God. And though perfection has eluded John and continues to elude me, I know that as I continue to trust the one who causes my heart to beat, it will continue to be well with my soul. How do you write that? And Karen would tell you, it's not all roses. There are times when she says it's waves and she feels like she can't make it through the day. But I, that's coming from somebody's heart who understands that this life is not all that there is. The cross tells you, and the, and the empty tomb tells you, friends, that suffering, though powerful and horrific and feels like it's crushing, is not the end. It doesn't have to define your life. We look at Jesus and we realize, and I'll just say it this way, do, do you right now, or have you, do you feel abandoned and alone? Jesus was abandoned by those closest to him when he needed them most. Do you feel crushed by the weight of grief and sorrow? Jesus was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief and pain. Do you feel rejected? He was despised and rejected by men. Do you feel like crying out, like, why is this happening? Jesus cried out at the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Have you been betrayed? Do you feel alone in your pain? Look to Jesus. As I said at the beginning, you can't tweet this answer in 130 characters. There's not a nice bow we tie on suffering. We do live in a world full of brokenness and pain. But God is not immune to it. He doesn't stand distant from it. He entered into it, and he will suffer alongside you now in the hope that these present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed. That's the hope. That's the Christian, Christian message. That this life is not the end. Suffering is not the last word. Jesus is the last word. And his word is grace and love and mercy and glory forever. Otherwise, what's your, what's your alternative? I'm working off my past sin. I'm hoping to realize this is not even real. I'm just muddling through until we're all die when the universe burns up? God says to you, I see you. I know more than you can realize what you're experiencing, and I'm with you. Let's pray. Father, I recognize that my words are inadequate, but your word is not. It's true, and it's eternal, and it's powerful. And I pray that you take whatever seeds may have been planted and multiply it in our hearts. Specifically, God, for those who are here who came here looking for some answer, who are in the midst of pain that they feel is crushing, God, by your spirit, make yourself known to them. Give them a sense of your presence with them in the midst of it. Help them to see that though it feels all-encompassing and overwhelming, it is not the final word. You are. We thank you, Lord Jesus that you are our final word. We pray in your name, amen.